Thank you. So you probably have heard this term quite a few times when it comes to technology. Oh, that's not rocket science. I can't do this. But sometimes technology really is rocket science, literally. Like if you want to bring rockets like this, the Falcon Heavy, um, to the sky, and even more impressively, bring those boosters back exactly on the pad or on the landing, landing vessel. Now, if you haven't heard yet, behind the scenes, what's going on is uh, a lot of the stuff running in these rockets is actually based on Linux. So there's a Linux running, and I think this shows that even for the most mission critical, safety critical applications these days, Linux can be the answer. So as Stefan has already um, introduced me, I'm Joachim Werner or Joe Werner. I'm the principal product manager for Automotive Edge at SUSE. Joined SUSE in 2004. So have been with the company for about half of its life or more than half of its life already in various roles from project management to uh, product management. But I also have a bit of an engineering background, had my own software company before I joined SUSE. Of course, doing open source stuff. Yeah, our vision at SUSE is to simplify, modernize, and accelerate. We want to help our customers to simplify how they run their businesses, simplify their IT environment, simplify their solutions, allow them to modernize, uh, transform business processes, sometimes very disruptively. And you'll see um, how this translates to mobility industry, to, to the vehicle in a minute, and also accelerate. If you think about acceleration, yes, of course, cars, you know, are all about speed, but also think about bringing new features to cars. This has always been a bit of a problem, and I'll get to that in a minute. And again, we think with our solutions, with our open source background, we can help a lot with accelerating how customers can bring solutions um, to the vehicle faster. SUSE, we are talking about the power of many. That's the power of many of our own employees, contributors, friends, but also all the communities that, that we are part of. And together with those communities, we now have a, a broad spectrum of, of, of offerings that are not just Linux. Of course, Linux is still at the core, and that may have been how you've heard about SUSE in the first place, maybe running a Linux distribution on your laptop or so, or uh, in a data center. But these days, Linux is, is, is only part of the offering. On, on that um, upper left-hand side, you see our software-defined infrastructure, software-defined compute, storage, and networking. Uh, that's the basis for bringing um, these container and cloud platform services um, to, to the hardware. And, and that's about running containerized solutions on site, in the public cloud, in multi-cloud environment, uh, and also at the edge. So if you haven't heard that term edge yet, edge is basically about computing that's not in a central data center or cloud, but closer to where data is processed or where um, actions have to be taken. Uh, this could be uh, in a telecom telecommunication facility. It could be um, small um, mini data centers uh, on site in a, in a factory, but also this, the far edge, let's say a car or truck. Yeah, and finally, just recently, we have started to work on uh, solutions um, that bring open source artificial intelligence and machine learning technology um, to our users. Uh, today, we are going to focus on that upper right corner, the edge computing, and in particular, of course, the far edge and bringing compute um, to the car. So as I've said, I've been with SUSE for most of the almost 30 years now that we are doing open source software and, and bringing open source solutions to enterprise customers and supporting them with their mission critical workloads. Um, I was part of the team that, that worked with SAP in uh, 2008 and, and, and uh, after that. Uh, these days, not only SAP itself is running on SUSE, but a lot of the most mission critical services, 
including things that you may not even expect. So if you go to one of the big web, web shops or so, chances are behind the scenes at some point, your data will hit an SAP system that's running an, a Subhana database on SISA Linux, for example. Uh, and just recently, we've announced yet another step. We um, announced that we have the intent to acquire Rancher Labs. Together with Rancher, which is one of the uh, most well-known and established open source um, and tools and, and frameworks for managing hybrid clouds, managing uh, container solutions from um, the edge to the core, to the cloud. Uh, we will have an even more complete portfolio from the Linux um, to the management stack. Um, as this is still uh, pending regulatory approval, I can't really go into more detail, but I've, I've linked the, the press release so you can look into that blog post if you want to learn more. Yeah, uh, coming back to open source. Um, as Gartner said it last year, open source is becoming the backbone for driving digital innovation. And that's not just in the data center, it's really from consumer electronics, from, from your mobile phone experience to um, yeah, actually rocket science as, as, as you've just seen. And SUSE is part of that in, in many places. I've just picked a few that are kind of related here. So in automotive um, of the 15 largest uh, tier one automotive vendors, 12 are running SUSE Linux. Uh, one of them soon even in the car already. And that's uh, what we are talking about today. We are also really strong in, in telecommunications. And I've put another one uh, in aerospace. So both uh, uh, military defense and, and um, civil aeros aerospace. Lots of customers rely on SUSE Linux. What we are talking about today, um, is a relationship that we just um, engaged with in the last couple of months. So um, March, April, we closed um, an agreement uh, with Electrobit, um, a, a fully owned subsidiary of Continental um, to develop Linux for autonomous vehicles, not just autonomous vehicles, but that's obviously the goal to have Linux in the car that's uh, safe and secure enough even for advanced uh, driver assist features up to uh, fully autonomous cars. Um, Electrobit um, has more than 30 years of experience in the automotive software market. Um, uh, more than 100 million vehicles and more than 1 billion um, ECUs and devices are running software written by Electrobit. And uh, we are proud to have this um, partner and to jointly develop um, this solution um, where we bring the best of our experience with open source and Linux together with Electrobit's experience in the automotive market. Um, those are really two worlds. So our world at SUSE is, is the data center. Um, yeah, something like that. And then there's uh, automotive. I've, I've deliberately picked a picture that doesn't really fit into this room because at the first glance, uh, those are very different worlds. So let's have a quick uh, peek into a typical uh, EE architecture in a, in a car um, today. So this is like current generation cars that are already on the streets. Usually you will have up to 100 dedicated computers or ECUs, um, sometimes just running a little real-time OS, uh, sometimes already running, running Linux or, or, or something um, similar. Um, like a QNX or, 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 or VX works or whatever. Um, just the wiring harness in such a car together with those compute units um, can weigh up to 80 kilos. So that's the same ball ballpark as the uh, electrical engine in an electrical car. And that's where the, uh, you know, the acceleration uh, comes, comes in uh, that I had on one of my first slides. You usually get what you've bought. So if you have bought a car five years ago, um, chances are that uh, the navigation system and the whole infotainment is, is kind of outdated and you may not get any updates for that. Um, and that's because of the way stuff has been developed. There was a project for bringing an infotainment system into that particular model and that's it. Yeah, It's very hard to update. Of course, there are a few exceptions and we'll get to that later. 
but of course it's a pity that you i don't know spent like 1500 uh, uh, euros on on your uh, navigation system or infotainment and now your your mobile phone has has the better navigation yeah um also cars are very different from traditional um it you have different um uh, network systems, bus systems, signal oriented versus uh, data oriented. So you have CAN bus, uh, FlexRay. Yeah, so it's not really the same world that Suze um, has been working in. Uh, let's look at that world a bit. I'm, I'm picking uh, a retailer as an example. So we have, um, let's say, an SAP backend system uh, in the data center, finance systems, um, um, ERP, and so on. Then there are lots of stores connected via the internet. Uh, the whole network is basically plain uh, Ethernet, of course. Um, um, that's uh, TCP IP based standardized networks. Uh, in the store, there may be a branch server and then lots of other devices, kiosk systems, uh, cash registers, point of service, uh, and also other like camera systems, whatever. Um, and of course, there's always um, an internet component. There's some cloud services. Um, customers today expect that you can um, check availability of products uh, via your mobile phone. Maybe even in the store, use your phone to to uh, get additional data or um, take part in a in a bonus program or a loyalty program, something like that. So um, obviously, this whole network has to be highly protected. You have to have user management. Um, customers have accounts on your central servers. Um, and this has to be secured across the board. Now, in a more futuristic or modern EE architecture in cars, um, things look a bit different than in that first picture that I, that I showed. Um, the number of ECUs um, is, is going to be reduced. So a lot of the compute power is centralized uh, on one or uh, just a few central compute um, clusters. Um, then there are so-called zonal ECUs. So basically all the sensors and actuators in a certain zone of your car, let's say your uh, left door or your front, uh, front end are connected to one of those zonal ECUs. And the network becomes uh, more similar to uh, a traditional data center network um, or wide area network where you have a, a, a basically an ethernet a ring backbone um, that um, transports all the traffic, be it um, camera data or um, just signals um, from, from, from um, sensors and, and actuator commands on the same uh, unified network. Um, that makes wiring much lighter, um, up to 20, 30 kilograms lighter. So that's a lot Looked, looking at the 80 kilograms that the, the traditional um, infrastructure weighs. And also um, because you can now connect more or less dump sensors and actuators um, to logic that's running on one of those central uh, computers, um, you can um, add more features as a software. So you, you can have software defined features and update those over the air, over the internet connection. So when you look at this picture, um, look at how this looks. So you have the central ethernet backbone, um, you have an internet connection for over the air updates, but also because customers of course want to have features like being able to check their um, charging status of their electric car on the phone or you know start the uh, air conditioning uh, half an hour before they actually uh, um, enter the car. Yeah, this, this is kind of similar to, to the picture that you just saw. I mean, of course I deliberately uh, um, painted it in a way that, that it's a perfect overlay. But a lot of the technology that we see in this retail store example now translates really nicely uh, into the, the car example. So you have all those different uh, kind of independent branch servers, if you want, in the doors, in the, uh, in the front end, back end section of the car. Um, the, the connections have to be secured because people could technically, you know, access your network um, somewhere um, in, this, in this backbone. Uh, you have internet connectivity, you have user accounts that have to be managed across the board and so on and so on. Uh, and that really led us to the idea that um, as SUSE, with all the experience we have uh, in 
data center in distributed compute environments like retail or banking or so. We can also contribute a lot um, to modern automotive platforms. What we are calling from the edge to the core to the cloud or uh, in the car example, um, rhyming even better from the core and uh, from the car to the core uh, to the cloud. And as you can see from this picture, we are not just working in automotive. We have customers in medical care, in, in industrial uses, retail and so on. But of course, today we are mostly talking about uh, automotive. But first, let's have a look into Linux in general. Linux is everywhere these days from air traffic control to stock markets to, of course, all the mobile devices, uh, your iPads, your, your mobile phones, um, and also aerospace and um, rail transportation, many different use cases. And the value of open source really is all about um, how the power of many, how all those contributors um, and it's so easy to contribute because you don't have to sign off, you know, lengthy contracts or, or get hired by a company. You can start small or as a, as a customer, you can uh, easily switch from just consuming stuff to contributing back. Um, and there's no real vendor lock-in. Of course, um, all of us as, as open source uh, companies try to convince you that our way of doing things is best, but it's not about locking you in with uh, expensive licenses or so. It's about the actual service and support that you get. And if you don't like it, you can go somewhere else. And the other thing really is that standards are not defined by standards bodies. Standards are in many cases um, defined by doing things, by customer-driven standardization. So several customers, let's say several automotive OEMs decide that they want to um, agree on certain standards. They just start working on an open source project. And sometimes this gets more formalized and sometimes it doesn't have to. And there's a lot of agility in this whole thing. So just a few numbers. Um, there's a new Linux kernel every eight to 10 weeks. And there are millions of lines of code that are moved. Um, in this case, for example, about 80K, 80,000 commits uh, from 4,000 authors. And the change rate is like eight changes or eight to nine changes per hour. And it's all under an open source license. Now, why would you use SUSE Linux in the car? Yeah, you may have heard that there's so many other uh, Linux options, uh, embedded Linux options, and so on. But I think that things are changing with the, uh, the safety and security requirements. A lot of the early approaches don't really fit too well anymore. Um, I think the most important part here is that first line from project to product. Um, in many cases, uh, developing software for cars is still a project. And that's what we had on the earlier slide. You know, your your infotainment just uh, after five years, six years, it's so rotten. I mean, it's really an old product that you don't want to use anymore. And that's why it was it was started in many cases, even long before the car was delivered and there were no updates. Um, so bringing standardized products to part of the stack, like the OS um, to make it easier to say, okay, well, I don't have to always start from scratch. I don't have to download this and then compile my own kernel and modify it and, and adapt it to the hardware. But using uh, software that, that can be used on multiple platforms and it's, it's pre-built, it's binaries already, uh, that's really the benefit. And uh, data centers and data center customers ran through all those problems before. So why do you have to um, um, learn from that again? Just, just use... Um, those those um, approval approaches. I remember in the early days, people would still compile their own kernels, compile their own web servers to optimize little things. And these days, you can basically look at all the, the standard server hardware platforms from all the major vendors, and they are certified on Cisalinus Enterprise, for example, and uh, stuff will just work. And uh, also security updates. Um, we provide security updates for up to 18 or 20 years without breaking certifications. And we are a one-stop shop 
when it comes to getting open source software. So it's not just, oh, I get my Linux uh, base from here and then I have the BSP overlay, uh, the board support pack for the hardware support. And then I have this and that. Um, we can provide uh, both fully supported and community supported uh, Linux uh, and, and open source stack software uh, that all works together. That's all built in a single build service uh, for all those hardware platforms. And we have a really proven track record and we are here to stay. So we have been doing this for almost 30 years and the plan is to do it for many, many decades from now and support our customers. Not everyone can say that. And we are financially really sound even in these critical uh, and difficult days. We've had a record numbers this year. I just want to pick one of the, the statements from earlier. So BSPs, the board support packets. Uh, packages. We think this approach is ultimately evil. It's a bit like in the early days of your um, Windows, um, Windows 95 or so, when you got your driver CD uh, for your graphics card or your mouse or whatever, and that was the only time you you got an update, uh, or you basically didn't get an update. You just got the original driver, uh, and then. Uh, what, once you switch to, let's say, a new version of Windows, your driver wouldn't fit anymore. And, and then th there came signed drivers and things got worse until um, more and more of those drivers were built into the OSs. And for Linux, this is even more impressive than, than on our other OSs. Basically, all the drivers are kind of built in. Uh, but for the embedded world, we still have these overlays. So the, the board manufacturers come come up with their own um, hardware support. And this makes things much harder in the long run. Yeah, we think that's the wrong model. Uh, of course, we have to convince a lot of people in the industry um, to change to a more upstream model where they work on those upstream projects, but that's really our mission in a way. So one of the things that really um, uh, are so much different in enterprise Linux than uh, in uh, embedded Linux in general, is how we can use a multi-layer quality assurance approach. And that's also kind of the magic why we are able together with Electrobit um, to aim for a safety certification for Linux. So there are the upstream open source projects, of course, that everyone else can also um, choose to use directly. And they have a lot of their own testing, unit testing, build testing, whatever. Uh, then we have the OpenSUSE community releases. And there are two types of that, um, a rolling release called Tumbleweed and, and one called OpenSUSE Leap. And there is um, fully automated uh, integration testing. So there are two rings, like first software has to um, be tested on its own. And then there's integration testing before every release. And those releases are almost daily for OpenSUSE. So it's a rolling release with always the latest and everything is, is automated uh, and tested um, and, and things are fixed before they get um, released in these in these uh, um, open source um, community releases. So the quality is already really decent. It's good enough to have your daily driver laptop running on OpenSUSE Tumbleweed like I do. Um, and then there's uh, SUSE Linux Enterprise. That's when we take this open source and community tested code to the next level where we have um, fully tested enterprise level releases and all the updates go uh, through lengthy testing. Uh, we then for the automotive project, pick only the, the most stable stuff and, and have a very limited set of updates that go into the automotive platform. And then and again at our partner at Electrobit, when they integrate this into EV Corpus Linux as, as the, the product name uh, is on, on, on Electrobit's end, uh, there's a lot more testing and integration. And then of course, um, we also come with the tools that the OEM, the automotive manufacturer can use um, to run the exact same test infrastructure that we have, that Electrobit has, again, on site for their own integration testing. We have addressed quite a few of the challenges of edge computing. Um, and I'm just picking a few. And you'll see that most of that is also interesting for the car. So in many cases, when you run edge data centers or um, computing, let's say in a retail store, there's no full-time IT staff on site. So you need remote management. And obviously in the car, it's the same thing. You don't expect the driver to be able um, to fix things. The days of the chauffeur that, that knows how to fix a, a, an engine 
are long gone and same uh, is true for IT. You don't want uh, the user to, to fix stuff uh, on the car computer. Um, systems may be set up by a customer or logistics contractor. Yeah, right. So um, basically anyone in a, in a, in a garage um, has to be able to do the software update. And then of course, ideally, uh, not everyone is there yet. Um, you can do over the air updates. Um, large scale deployments. Um, some of our customers have millions of cars shipped every year. And that's really large scale, same as in, in, in other industries. And then factory preloads, obviously. Yeah, that's, that's, that's almost, <laughs> uh, I mean, that's a given for automotive because um, the cars are built on the conveyor belt in a factory and they need to be preloaded with the software there. And it shouldn't be, uh, it shouldn't take hours or, or days to do so, but it has to be a very quick and efficient process. Um, then the initial deployment, once that's happened, um, there's a trust issue. Just like your mobile phone has to uniquely identify um, against um, the update network of, of your um, phone manufacturer or your, your network provider, a car has to be uniquely identified because you don't want um, uh, modified um, cars that, that are not up to spec, that have maybe not, not have a, a certification by, let's say, a TÜV in Germany um, to connect to your network and get updates. Um, you need to configure your cars. Um, sometimes features are software defined, like uh, the customer hasn't purchased that feature and, and the update shouldn't go out for that feature. And then of course, over time you need uh, patching and, and over the air updates and so on. And then finally monitoring. Modern cars um, are collecting lots of data that is used uh, for telemetry, for um, predictive analysis. So this is really a, a story that I didn't build for the automotive industry. This was a pitch that we had originally prepared for other edge scenarios, but it, it's to the point. And the product that we are building for that market, um, the SUSE Micro OS, um, has a lot of the features that you'll also need in automotive. Like it's predictable, um, it's not altered during runtime. So the whole system is basically read only. Um, you can roll back to a known good state by just rebooting. Um, it's very scalable um, and it's reliable. I'll just very briefly go through those highlights because as I said, this is, is not automotive specific, uh, very minimal footprint. Actually for the, the actual car project that we are working on with Electrobit, the footprint is even smaller than we, we have in, in this micro OS. Um, it supports Intel um, and, and IMD and ARM architectures. Uh, again, that's important for automotive. A lot of the automotive platforms are ARM 64 bit. Um, it's immutable, as I said, read only with a health check. So next time you reboot and something went wrong with the update, it will automatically roll back. Um, currently in the car, some somewhat different stacks are used, but a lot of the, the concepts uh, carry over. We have the SE Linux security framework, exactly as we have in the car solution. And uh, yeah, we can update uh, with small updates. Um, that's not always the same in the car because they sometimes want, you know, um, fully encrypted uh, firmware updates, but we are working on, on bringing those, those, those Delta updates to the car as well. Yeah, just picking a few of those. Uh, and then there's uh, containers. I'll get to those uh, now. Um, most of the modern software stacks are using workload containers on top of uh, an operating system, usually Linux because a container is a very nice way of putting exactly what the application needs into a box and shipping that box. And basically the developer knows, okay, if, if my container has worked in my, uh, on my laptop or in my test environment, it will also work in production. Um, this is what we are doing with micro OS. And it's also um, part of the story for automotive, um, for adaptive autosar, but also, um, more revolutionary concepts where we are thinking about really running um, setups similar to what you do with Kubernetes in the data center on the car. Uh, I've just picked a few of the, the options that you have for managing those containers. Uh, in the car, we're currently using system D N spawn. That's the most lightweight way of starting a container um, with just uh, the Linux uh, system daemon. Uh, then there's Podman that allows you to already um, 
start containers um, as so-called pods. So several application components in a single configuration with its uh, network and the ports that should be open and how they, they connect like the database um, connects to, to the backend server and so on. And um, then there's K3S, a lightweight full Kubernetes that comes in a single binary. This is uh, one of the uh, projects that Rancher Labs is working on. And, and uh, we are really enthusiastic about being able to integrate with that. And finally, full Kubernetes. Um, as I said, at the moment in the car, we, we are just up there. Um, but we expect that going forward, um, those in-car computers um, become more and more like compute clusters and we may use more of those technologies even in the car. Yeah, uh, one way of looking at, uh, at this is um, even if you don't need any of those scheduling features of, of, of Kubernetes and, and container engines like starting and stopping containers on demand and, and, and you're spawning more if you need more of a certain type, um, just the virtual bill of materials of software that should be running in the car uh, it's so much easier if you can use uh, technology like those um, text files, the YAML files that Kubernetes uses, or Helm charts, uh, and then also you know configuration tools like Salt or Ansible. Um, and we think that a lot of that will translate very nicely um, to car use cases. Yeah, this is a, a picture of how this uh, whole ecosystem in the car could look like with a central compute cluster and those solar ECUs, and think of those. Um, as potentially uh, basically two different types of Kubernetes clusters. The central compute cluster is one, and then all those zonal ECUs are kind of a distributed cluster as well. Yeah, this is another picture that, that kind of um, all, um, shows how the, the architecture can look like. And there are more components, yeah, like you may want to add virtualization, KVM or Xen into the picture. Um, there are also automotive specific hypervisors or embedded specific hypervisors, but we think that most of the stuff can be done on KVM. Um, so for example, you could run um, a VM that, that is an Android um, infotainment system unchanged in such an environment um, and consolidate existing hardware on a single uh, cluster. And then most of the workloads would probably be workload containers or as I'm calling them, uh, containerized vehicle functions. And there can also be RTOS, uh, real-time OSs, um, because as you'll see, um, for uh, the, the full setup, Linux will not um, handle all the most safety critical um, features on its own from day one. So let's look a bit into this um, story, the certification story. Um, this is what Electrobit is, is doing with us. Um, we are talking about security, um, things like cybersecurity, uh, this UN ECE, uh, WP29. Um, then um, for the OEM, you know, bring the time to market down and so on. I've, I've been talking about that. And finally, safety. And safety, um, if you are familiar with the automotive industry, there's the ASIL uh, standards, um, ASIL A to D. Um, we are currently expecting Linux to, to, to need at least ASIL B level. And then the, the total solution, uh, let's say a self-driving uh, autonomous car, of course, has a lot of ACL D level features, but together with real-time um, OSs and, and, and cleverly combining um, the stack, we, we think the Linux will, will have to, to uh, reach at least ACL B. And uh, there is uh, a bit of a question, how can a Linux OS that hasn't been developed from scratch following um, SPICE or other um, safe um, development processes, but it's a community. How can this actually be certified according to, let's say, the uh, automotive ISO um, 26262? And the answer that um, Electrobit um, has found together with us um, is that we can look at um, the parent um, standard. So actually ISO 26262 implements the IEC uh, 61508, and there are uh, provisions in that standard that allow to meet um, safety targets by other means. So basically, you can you can explain why uh, things are 
um, safe, although they weren't developed was, according was, was, was um, to, um, hast du, hast du the, uh, the automotive standards. Gearbeitet? And that's what we're really um, ja, doing das heißt, here. Man soll nicht um, hinten there's a lot of um, complicated stuff involved in, in making this happen. Um, but we are really confident um, together with Electrobit that um, next year or, or early 2022, we will see the first cars with um, safe Linux on the roads. Uh, at the moment, um, we are in the middle of shipping uh, an Intel-based architecture to uh, a first customer. So um, during the winter time, we'll have the first test cars um, with uh, SUSE Linux in the car on the streets. Um, and then these cars are, are collecting data for the second step, for the certification step. Uh, we are also working on an, an ARM architecture for other customers. And the goal uh, is, as I said, showing compliance with an uh, IEC uh, 61508 under this um, yeah. uh, section 6, 3. 3. The exactly. life cycle uh, of those Linux distributions is an interesting um, problem that not everyone has solved. So SUSE has offerings for that. We have long-term service pack support, long-term support, um, even special deals for certain customers um, so that we can support operating systems for, as I said, up to 18 or 20 years. So this is an example from our standard SUSE Linux Enterprise 15 offering. And we are working very closely with Electrobit to have um, to bring those long life cycles to the automotive industry so that um, uh, an automotive um, kernel doesn't have to be updated every couple of, of months or so um, with the latest. In many cases, um, people are just not updating it, but they will have to because of the cybersecurity regulations. One of the benefits um, of this new approach is that when you're using almost data center technology, um, you can also use almost uh, common off the shelf hardware in the car, of course, hardened for automotive use, but you can use standard Intel CPUs, ARM CPUs, and we'll expect a lot of the technology in the car to be more generic. So not so many special ECUs that can just do one thing, like, okay, I'm the air brake controller, I'm the camera controller, uh, but just like in the data center um, software um, that of course sometimes needs uh, accelerator cards. Or so um, does, does most of the logic. Um, and those software defined functions, or as I've called them containerized vehicle functions also allow running the same um, software in a cloud, for example, or in, in, in a, on a laptop in a, in, a, in, a, in a test environment, as long as all your uh, sensors and actuators also have a software implementation that like a test case, a, a unit test. Uh, and I think that's, that's really promising. You can do a lot of integration testing long before the final hardware is, is decided on and before um, the first um, uh, test vehicles are on the road. Yeah, the virtual test, uh, virtualized test driven um, development, that's really um, uh, one of the, the core features here. Now let's summarize. Um, first of all, we want to really bring Linux to the car and not just uh, for infotainment, but for all the layers of the software infrastructure in the car from a central compute cluster to zonal ECUs. We are doing this together with Electrobit. Um, as I said, the first um, pilot customer is going to have cars with SUSE Linux um, on the streets this fall. Uh, this winter, and then um, we expect um, these cars to collect data for, for the safety certification and so on, and we'll see um, hopefully a safety uh, certified um, SUSE Linux or an Electrobit uh, Corpus Linux um, in the next couple of months. Um, and that's, that's really a great, great step forward. But we will also go beyond that. We want to make sure that a lot of the technologies for container management that, that are being used in the data center, in telecommunication and so on, um, are translated into the car. Uh, one example that, that, that is kind of a blueprint is how the telecommunication industry really switched from um, shipping custom hardware um, to basically setting up standard servers and running all the the, the compute functions, the network functions as virtual machines or later containers. 
And I think this can also translate nicely into the automotive industry. And finally, as I've mentioned before, um, this will mean that there's a convergence of technology from the car to the data centers, to the clouds, allowing things like testing your stack in the cloud or having engineers working on the exact same technologies when they build a feature um, for the car, let's say as part of the navigation system stack uh, and the backend where the data is hosted and uh, other backends that take care of user authentication of, of um, um, making sure that the user really gets what, what, what he or she has, has bought. Yeah, um, unfortunately we don't have uh, the automotive white paper just ready yet, but um, we have a white paper on innovation at the edge that you can download at this uh, URL. And um, that's, that's basically the end of my uh, presentation. We have now some time for, for the Q&A.